was on the pro vitamin D bandwagon like back in 2013. Now on Twitter are starting to know me as the anti-vitamin D guy because it's rat poison. What vitamin D is gonna do in the system is it is going to raise your blood calcium. Now, what happens when the blood calcium goes up? Some people will say, well, the body keeps the blood calcium under a very tight regulation or else you could get in big trouble, you could die. This is how vitamin D works as a rodenticide, as killing mice and rats. It raises their blood calcium so high that they die. The scientists are being paid with a goal in mind to show that vitamin D is good. You don't get a lot of honesty in science these days. I absolutely believe that humans need sunlight or certain bands of ultraviolet light on their skin to be healthy. The question is, the assumption that it is vitamin D that is the key thing, that is the mediator of all of these benefits of light is something I'm not sure about. Hi, this is Owen Robinson, creator of Genetic Insights, Feel Younger, and the Rejuvenate podcast, which you're watching now. If you enjoy the episode, by the way, make sure to like, subscribe, and leave a comment, letting us know what you thought. And so today I'm very happy in this episode, I'm interviewing Dr. Garrett Smith. And I'm really happy about that for a few reasons. First of all, he's the most requested guest so far. We've had quite a few YouTube comments of people either requesting that we have him as a guest or saying how much Dr. Smith has personally helped them, which is great. Number two, Dr. Smith has actually really helped me. I um, found his work about a year ago and uh, applying what I learned, especially in his program, which we talk about later on in the interview, um, was very helpful for me. And in fact, I have shared some of his work, specifically toxic bile theory in a previous episode and given my own take on that. So I uh, very much appreciate him developing that theory along with other people and making me aware of that. And Third of all, I'm very happy to have him on because he is a controversial figure. And most of what is considered to be, you know, conventional wisdom, both in the mainstream world, but even in the alternative world, Dr. Smith challenges that. And I really like that. And does that mean that I think he's necessarily absolutely right about absolutely everything? Not necessarily. Although I will say, actually... Of everything that we talked about in this episode, I do agree with uh, the vast majority of it. And in fact, you know, I indicate often that I do agree with him about the things that we talked about today. And there are some things that I don't agree or disagree. I just don't know, right? I haven't put enough research into it myself, but I'm happy for him to share his perspective. And so just to remind you, when we have guests on this channel, sometimes they may even be saying opposite stuff, right? Dr. Smith is very much against vitamin A, for instance. I'm happy to have a guest on who's an expert who uh, talks about, you know, how great vitamin A is. I'd like to hear, you know, both perspectives. I'd like to hear different perspectives on things, so long as they are, you know, come from someone who has really uh, thought it through and who has a, a, a clear uh, perspective on things. So, in fact, I have invited a couple of people on who would have that perspective, and so far they've declined, not necessarily for that reason, but... So I am open to different perspectives is my point, but I really like people who challenge the mainstream, not for the sake of it, but because they have an insatiable kind of quest to get to the truth. And so far, all the experts that we've had on, I would say are exactly that. And Dr. Smith may be there more than anyone else. He goes after what he believes to be true, you know, no matter what that involves questioning, no matter who that involves, you know, not going along with. And so that's a quality that I very much admire. So. If you haven't heard of Dr. Smith, then I encourage you to keep an open mind. Um, as I said, most of what he says here is the opposite of what pretty much everyone is saying. And even if you're quite skeptical, being skeptical is great. But I would say, look, even if he's only right about one of the many things that he says here, and that's something that you apply, that may be something that changes your life. You know, So it's always good to be open. And if you are a big fan of Dr. Smith's work already, and, you know, for instance, I've been through his program several times, then I'd say, yes, it is worth in watching. I wasn't sure if it would be, but actually, in the end, we talked about quite a few things that I haven't seen him talk about before in any of his published work. Maybe he has, and I haven't seen it. But so I learned a bunch of new things, um, and new takes on things, new perspectives that I found very interesting. So even if you are a big fan of his work, I do recommend uh, watching the interview all the way through, especially towards the end of the interview. There was quite a lot of new information that I hadn't heard before. 
So uh, please enjoy the interview, keep an open mind, and remember to uh, like the video, subscribe, and share any questions underneath on YouTube. So today I have the absolute pleasure of being joined by uh, Dr. Garrett Smith. Dr. Smith is known as the Nutritional Detective. His website is nutritiondetective.com. He's the creator of the Love Your Liver program, which I'm a member of. He's also a licensed naturopathic medical doctor, and he has a Bachelor of Science in Physiology and Nutrition. Dr. Smith, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So I'm a big fan of your program. Um, I first came across the, the idea of vitamin A maybe not being a vitamin, and as a result of that, um, uh, Grant Genero's work through you initially, and the actual, uh, we've really done an episode on that. We can definitely talk about that if you'd like to. But the reason that I found you and the reason I was drawn to you and the thing that initially piqued my curiosity was talking about uh, toxic bile theory because it really matched my own experience in a way that no one else's uh, theory or understanding ever had. Like, And so I would love to talk about that and really focus on that today. And that may well bring us into talking about vitamin A and all kinds of other things as well. But yeah, so let's let's get straight into it. Before we talk about that, um, can I just ask why nutritional detective? Why nutrition detective? Okay, so it was, well, when I was getting out into the, the wild west of the internet more, when I decided to go virtual, I just basically decided to go all telemedicine, all virtual, and a buddy of mine who's who used to be in um film production he was like you got to come up with like a name like what what are you who are you like kind of like the branding right and i was kind of like what do i do and i was it was just kind of like i in, i investigate things i follow threads i i'm open to whatever the truth is like that's really all i'm looking for and i'm i actually consider one of my greatest assets to be filtering through the BS very, very quickly. Like I just have a, a very fast BS filter and I'm a very fast reader and I have a really good memory. So I tend to go through this stuff quicker than most. And I I'm very fast at self experimentation. And so testing things out on myself to see, are they true or not? Cause like things I learned in hair testing in, in the basic education of hair testing and analysis, I got I was like, is this actually true? And then I tested it on myself and I was like, this is not true at all. So they're just making, you know, making stuff up or it happened one way to one person. Then they said, well, this is the way that it is for everybody. That's, that's actually something else I've brought, as I've said, like, just because like a lot of doctors, they'll try a new thing. They'll see it work on three people. I've seen this so many times with so many doctors, myself included, you try something that works on like the first three people. And then you think this is the key to everybody and then it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> or somebody tries one method on themselves and they're like, this is the fix to everybody. And you go, no, that doesn't work. So, so the detective thing just came about because I was, that it seemed to fit. And that's really what I felt like I was doing was just drilling down to where is the truth of this stuff. And <sighs> You know, my dad taught me when I was young, he said there was a saying he taught me, which I know was not his saying, but he said, believe half of or believe nothing of what you hear and only half of what you see. And, and so a kind of kind of cynical, but also very true in today's world. So it's it just kind of stuck. I, I said, what about like a detective? And my buddies were like, that's really good. And I was like, OK, well, let's just go with it then. So. And now it really seems to fit with like the live streams where I go into the toxic bile theory and here's what's causing it and here's the evidence. And I'm just showing, you know, study after study after study after study that's backing up, you know, these these patterns. And so yeah. I loved it when I found out philosopher actually means lover of truth. Um, from philo meaning love and soft uh, meaning like wisdom or truth. But yeah, I'd say what your what your name's actually more appropriate because you're an investigator of truth, right? <laughs> so that makes sense. <laughs> Uh, can you tell us just a little bit about your background before we get into the um, toxic bile failure as much as you want to share? Well, I was, um, I mean, it's kind of like for me, fitness, I started lifting weights at home when I was 11 because I got into, you know, like the bodybuilding idea and all that stuff. And so fitness led to, um, I got into personal training 
and then I got into all the seminars and that, and then I started seeing that like the, the normal, the normal, the quote unquote normal methods of exercise were leaving a lot of, uh, damaged bodies behind. And so I kind of started looking into other avenues. There's gotta be something better here. And then fitness always leads eventually, if anybody pays attention, fitness leads to nutrition. So nutrition led me to, you know, taking some nutrition classes in college, working in a supplement store. And then as when I worked in the supplement store, I found out about naturopathic medical school and there happened to be one, you know, two hours away from me. So I just decided I enrolled. I was all ready to enroll. It was funny, like, you know, destiny, whatever you want to call it. I applied to all these master's degree schools. I applied to all these things and and never before in my life had I been rejected from a school. <laughs> no. And all of a sudden I'm getting rejected, 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 rejected. And then I applied to this. When I found out about this school, I had all my applications ready. I submitted them. I interviewed within a week and I was accepted into the next class within a month. And so it, when, it, when it was ready to happen, it was, it was like that. There's, there's been times in my life where I've felt like, you know, times were tough and I was like, maybe doing this isn't right for me. And every time I thought about doing something else, something would bring me back in. So I'm definitely supposed to be here. And then, uh, I do tell people about naturopathic medicine though. I say, don't plan on getting a job. Like there's not that many jobs. You better be an entrepreneur and you better be planning on running your own business. Maybe you'll get a job, but you better plan on doing this on your own because there's nobody out there to really help people like me. <laughs> And even then I'm a black sheep in my naturopathic community, especially like with vitamin A, like most naturopathic doctors, they just, they have a love affair with vitamin A. The, the obscene mega doses of vitamin A that we were taught for, for simple colds and flus, which aren't what people think they are, is just outrageous. There was, there was a guy I saw on Facebook, sorry, this one doctor, he promoted the, the huge vitamin D and the huge vitamin A for colds and flus, and he just died of a heart attack. Like, yeah, so I'm just like, yeah, maybe it's not working out so well. But uh, yeah, I'm even a black sheep in my field. So <laughs> so what led you to break free from the orthodoxy? Because what I find is that, unfortunately, the more qualified people are, I think because they've spent so much years, so many years and so much money to, to be indoctrinated into a particular system, it's very, very hard for them to open their minds and step out of it. And you... you uh, uh, you know, have remained completely open to, you know, pursuing, as you say, the truth, as you see it above all else. So, you know, for me, one of the things that motivated me is my own struggles and all the orthodoxy and all the dogma not uh, being satisfactory to help me. So was it something similar for yourself? Yeah, there was definitely, I mean, I was, I would, sometimes I, I tell people, I mean, and I remind myself that I think I've, I've really poisoned myself doing the health the health nuttery out there. I think the reason why I, I mean, I had, I had prostate issues in my mid twenties. I, I got my, I inherited my dad's allergies. If you want to call it that, I don't really have them anymore. And my dad died with terrible allergies. So it was kind of scary. Like I was seeing when I was in medical school, like I'm developing prostate problems at 25. The students, the student clinicians and the doctors didn't really even take it seriously. They wanted to work on other stuff that I had going on. And I'm like, I have to pee five times before I go to bed. And my dad has prostate cancer. Like, um, can we, <laughs> can we work on this? So I think I was really, I may have actually in my early thirties, I'm pretty sure I was developing a, a skin cancer here. So like I was, I was, I was not what anybody I think would have called sick but I wasn't well for sure. And I think I just was born with a really good constitution so that I was able to poison myself a lot and figure out the poisoning without getting too sick that I wasn't functional. But why did I get into all the different stuff? It was, I, I want to say, well, I mean, going into naturopathic medicine by, by alone is like outside of the norm, right? I was, I was, I tried the doctor's um, I think ketoconazole when I was maybe a teenager, I think maybe about 15 or 16, I took ketoconazole for, um, tinea versicolor, a skin, little skin fungus. doesn't really hurt anything, but the doctor told me like, if you take this, it may make it go away for a, for a season for the summer. 
and it'll come back the next summer because if you're just susceptible to it, you're just susceptible to it. But then he also told me that you could put Selsun Blue on it and just like coat on the Selsun Blue and leave it on for a half hour and then that may kill it. And this is this is years this is this is I remembered this years later and so I thought, well, I look at the active ingredient of Selsun Blue and it's selenium and I went wait, are we just supplementing our skin with selenium and that's what's getting rid of the fungus? So then I actually ended up doing a high dose of selenium. I'm not going to say what it was because I was pushing the the safe limits of it. And, and I, I would do that with somebody in my program if I was supervising them, but I'm not just going to throw it out on the internet because people do all sorts of terrible stuff with good information. Um, but I got rid of it like it went away. So I corrected my selenium deficiency and it went away. Well, the funny thing is, is then you go, well, you can use head and shoulders shampoo, cake it on, leave it on for like half an hour, and it'll make it go away for a while too. Well, head and shoulders is zinc, another huge mineral we use. So then like, let's say I got lucky and I chose the right mineral for what I was deficient in and somebody else, it might be zinc. And so somebody tries these different things and they don't figure it out. But that was like an early kind of solution thing where I went, I actually think the ketoconazole messed up my testosterone production as a teen. Cause like I could never train as hard as my buddies. And for those of you who want to go investigate it, go search ketoconazole and testosterone and you'll find ketoconazole destroys testosterone in men. And they're giving it to our young males, kind of like Accutane just ruins sexual function. And we're just giving it to all these young men and women and just ruining them all for, to look a little better. Which is funny, you ruin, your, you, you ruin your health just to look a little better and then you're not sexually functional. You're trying to look better to, in theory, you know, mate, and then you don't, you don't function right for that or you don't, you know, it doesn't work right. So anyway, I was just, I got into it because <laughs> as so many of us know, the, the medical community failed me completely. And, uh, oh, I had, I had uh, what they thought was valley fever or mono or nobody could figure it out. Went to a bunch of doctors. I, I, after it, what, here's what happened. It was one summer. I was on five sports teams. I was on two basketball teams, two baseball teams, and a swim team over the course of two and a half months. And by the end of the summer, I have like what looks like chronic fatigue syndrome. And I didn't have any male role models or the internet to tell me you have to eat a lot more food or you're going to fall apart. I was always a big eater, but I never thought about eating even more. And I, and I was going to games and meets and it was just, there. it was nonstop. I was, I was good. So I started everywhere. So by the end of the summer, I've got this back pain. I'm sleeping 14 hours a day. Nothing, nothing is going right. And they, they had no options for me. And all of a sudden, then I just took off like the first quarter of school, did no sports. And then I felt a lot better. No doctor ever maybe went, how much are you doing? Maybe you could rest. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So it was like things like that where they, they just completely failed me that I was looking somewhere else. My dad was a dentist, so I always liked medicine and my brain was always kind of towards that. My dad was an amazing technician at dentistry. I mean, people died before they left him. He didn't take new clients for the no, new patients for the first, the last five years of his practice. So that's how much people liked him. And so it's, it's just, I had those role models and I, you know, questioned everything and I'm okay with if I'm wrong. This was a big thing that I first started because people now is now on Twitter are starting to know me as the anti-vitamin D guy because it's rat poison. I mean, it is. If you look up Terra D3, T-E-R-A-D3 or D-Con and you look up the active ingredient, it's colocalciferol. It's the same stuff that they sell you in your, in your vitamin D pills. But I was, I was on that. I was on the pro vitamin D bandwagon, like back in 2013. So everybody thinks like they're, they're making some huge discovery these days. I'm like, I was on that 11 years ago. I was getting, I was so into it. I, how much were you doing? How much was I doing? The most I did, I took at one point, I thought I was going to be, I thought I'd be efficient and also sort of lazy. <laughs> so Thorne used to make 25,000 unit vitamin D3 pills. So one pill was 25,000 units. And I thought, okay, I'm just going to take two of these 50,000 units one day a week and that'll have because it's fat soluble, right? So you can just store it, which is the crazy thing about fat soluble vitamins nowadays is like everybody's in denial that you actually store and accumulate these things. It's like people have totally, it used to be got to watch out for fat soluble vitamins. They might, they might, they store 
and you might accumulate too much of them. And now it's like, everybody's just like, no, it doesn't happen. And I'm going, it's been in the research for like a hundred years. What do you, what do you mean? It just disappeared. So anyway, so I took 50,000 one day a week. And after a couple of weeks, I started noticing the pattern of when I took that on Sunday, I wouldn't poop for two days and going from a normal two or three a day to zero for two days was fairly eye opening. And then I read this other, I won't say what health approach it was, but I read this other book of kind of like acts, uh, little phrases or, or ideas from this other practitioner. And he said, too much vitamin D can constipate you. And I went, Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I stopped taking that, stopped having that problem. And I, and then soon after that, I, I got into hair mineral analysis and in the common hair mineral analysis stuff, they will teach you that vitamin D supplements on the hair test raise calcium. You can watch it happen. They, it, I'm sorry. It raises, yeah, it raises calcium and it lowers potassium. Well, what else do they say on hair analysis? They say a high potassium and a low, uh, sorry, a high calcium and a low potassium is a hypothyroid pattern. Well, what's this common symptom of hypothyroidism? Constipation. So we've got vitamin D causing a, a hypothyroid pattern. I noticed distinct constipation when I took too much vitamin D. And then I just, I, that was where I flipped. And then later on, I caught on to the, uh, the rat poison thing and all of that stuff. And then I just started going, this is like, this is really not good. Everybody loves vitamin D. And everybody's saying it's good now, which means you should probably reevaluate when everybody's saying something is good, probably not. So it, that, that was like a big start of it, but that was actually where I was, I was giving it to my clients on a regular basis. I was like, you got to get your vitamin D levels up. You got to get them up. Some people felt better. Most people felt nothing. And, and quite a few people felt worse. And that's where I started going, something's not right here because if this was so wonderful, I shouldn't have people feeling worse. And it's, uh, when I figured it out that I didn't want people to take it, this is the part that, that I think you were kind of alluding to earlier in terms of me being out of the ordinary was that I, there was no hesitation in me realizing that I had made a mistake. I had to undo that mistake. I had to admit I was wrong directly to my patients and say, look, not easy, right? I mean, look, new information has come to light. Like that, that line in the big Lebowski, right? <laughs> it's come to light, man. And I just told him, I'm like, do not take that anymore. I'm sorry. I put you on it. I know what it does now. I don't want you on it. Don't take it anymore. We're, we're done with the vitamin D thing. And if they said, I want to keep taking it, I'll be like, okay, that's, that's your call. I'm telling you, I'm not putting anybody else on it anymore. You can do what you like up to you. But I'm, so I had to do that with vitamin D and I had to do it with vitamin A because I used to prescribe vitamin A to my people too. So all of a sudden I, I, I read Grant Jenneru's work. That was, that was a funny thing. Cause I was, um, a guy I know, Matt Stone of 180 degree health. He was promoting, he wrote a blog about Grant and people who Matt Stone and I wrote a book together called, uh, solving the paleo equation. And so he was a buddy of mine. And he said in the, in the blog comments, somebody has said, does Dr. Smith know about this? And Matt said, he, sh I hope so. He should. So I'll, I'll let him know. I think he sent me the blog post to read and I read it and I went, okay, sounds a little trendy. Sounds like the new fad or of whatever's bad. Um, so I, what I decided to do, I actually said this to myself. I said, I'm going to put it on the back burner. I'm going to let it kind of marinate. I'm going to just see what happens with it. Does it, does it develop further? And then I think Matt wrote a blog post about it of his own. And he was making very, very sound logical points and pointing towards Grant's website again. And I went, okay, here it is again. I'm going to go look into it. And then when the eBooks were free, I went and I read the eBooks I got. So I'd been having some issues with my long-term patients where they were doing better at the start. And then over the long term, they were starting to, to, you know, get a little tired or they were like, my hair's a little thinning or do you know what's going on? Dry, like little dry skin was coming up. And I went, we tried just doing my normal things, but I was sitting there internally. This is another thing that I do. 
I was sitting there going, I'm missing something. Something is slipping by me. Not, not that they're doing, like a lot of people would assume that their patients are doing something wrong. It's the patient's fault because the, the approach is perfect. If you're not doing it right, then it'll fail. Like all these diets where they're like, oh, here's 10 ways you can screw up the diet. And I'm like, no, the diet's not right. <laughs> and you're just coping. Um, so I, uh, I read half of Grant's first book, half of it. He's written, he wrote, he has three books. I read half of his first book. I remember sitting back in my chair and being like, oh my gosh, I have to change everything. And it, it felt like everything it was just vitamin A, but I was like, that's the first thing on my treatment plants. Like that is, that is the top thing. That's the first thing I do with calcium and magnesium is address it with vitamin A or not. And I was, I was, I mean, there was times where I was giving liver pills. I was telling people to eat more of the brightly colored fruits and vegetables and all this stuff. And I just went, and I, so again, I had to go around and any, anybody who ever, I didn't go hunt down every single person who'd ever worked with me. Cause that's just beyond the scope. But every person who came back to me, I said, you need to get off of this. We are done with this here. Go read these books if you want to, but I'm not using this anymore. And I don't think you should either. And it could be the cause of your long-term stuff that that's not getting fixed. And people started coming back and saying, I feel better without it. And I was like, okay, this is good. This is good. So, um, that was how we kind of like, so twice, actually three times now, recently I came around on nicotinic acid or flesh niacin. And before I, we get to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Can I go back to the vi vitamin A and D? So, uh, if people are wondering why I'm taking this theory seriously, which I am, uh, you know, back in 2020, I felt the sickest I ever had. And I was on very high dose vitamin D3. I remember I read a book on it called How to Take High Dose Vitamin D3 Without Killing Yourself. So that wasn't <laughs> enough of a warning. Um, and I was having very large doses of liver. And I had severe issues, severe anxiety, all kinds of uh, digestive issues, sleep issues. I lost a lot of weight. I basically was acting like someone who'd been severely poisoned. Um, and they could find nothing wrong with me other than high levels of vitamin D3 when they did the lab test and they just told me to stop taking it, which I then did. Um, so from experience, I know that when you do <laughs> the kind of experiment that Dr. Smith is talking about and really go for it with these things. Now, so obviously too much of these things, I guess by definition, everyone would agree that too much is too much and it's bad. So then let me just ask you for the people wondering who are like, so first of all, we, we, as I said, we covered vitamin A in a different episode. You're welcome to talk about it if you like, but I think D3 would be more interesting to people because everyone's talking about how beneficial it is these days, right? So why is it not good other than what you've already said of imbalancing the minerals and why do some people feel better when they take it? So I'm going to be honest right off the bat. I don't have all the answers for all of for the, the strict answers for all of these because nobody's studying it that way, right? I mean, the scientists are being paid with, with a goal in mind to show that vitamin D is good. Like if anybody thinks that scientists these days don't go into things with biases and they're, they're not corrupt so that they can, I mean, scientists are beholden to the people who fund their research. So if they know the person wants a good study on vitamin D, they're going to give it or they're, they're not going to get money again. So you don't get a lot of honesty in science these days. So the thing about vitamin D so here's, I want to start it off with this. I absolutely believe that humans need sunlight or certain bands of ultraviolet light on their skin to be healthy. That's an important thing. So wh why do we not have a lot of hair? Well, it's so we can soak up light, right? That's, that's a big, that's a big thing. The question is, the assumption, and I say it that specific way because, you know, when you assume you make an ass out of you and me, um, the assumption that it is vitamin D that is the key thing that, that is the mediator of all of these benefits of light is something I'm not sure about. Because as I show in a lot of my videos, like cholesterol is, is, I don't think we understand cholesterol very well at all, but to me, it looks more like a, a, either a waste product or a product that is meant to protect us from toxic things like LDL cholesterol. The bad cholesterol has vitamin A in it 
funny that we call it the bad type and it's got vitamin A in it. So what is vitamin D then? It's oxidized cholesterol. Like it is a form of cholesterol that goes up to the skin. It is then oxidized and then goes back into the system. And I'm sitting there going, wait, we have, I, I just, on the, the study I went over last week on um, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, they were talking about lots of the Lou Gehrig's disease problems being caused by oxidized cholesterols and oxidized sterols. And then all of a sudden I'm supposed to believe that this one oxidized cholesterol that turns into like, there's at least 25 different forms of vitamin D in the body, but we only measure really one, maybe two. We might, we normally measure the 25 hydroxy, right? Colocalciferol. Maybe some people measure the 125 dihydroxy cholesterol, which is the active form. So they measure the storage form. They don't measure the active form. It's kind of like when they try to measure thyroid and they measure TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, instead of measuring actual thyroid hormone. Like, <laughs> do you want to look at how many dollars you put of, of gas into your gas tank or do you want to look at your gas gauge? Like, look at the gas gauge, right? Don't look at the price on the meter. Just look at the actual gas gauge. Is it full? But they don't want to do that. So we have those mineral changes. Um, we have <laughs> the fact that it is a fat store. I, I call it a fat storable alcohol. Like people start trying to say it's a hormone and I'm like, you can call it, they can call it a secosteroid hormone all they want. I'm like, it's an alcohol. It is an alcohol. It's an oxidized cholesterol. Like it's called OL. It ends in OL. Cholesterol ends in OL. Calcitriol, which is the active form, ends in OL. And then what we see and what was probably happening to you is when people take excess amounts of D3 or D2, you may have seen this yourself. They often see their, their, the normal blood test for vitamin D stay fairly steady or hardly go up. Did you ever notice that? Like you may have taken a lot of vitamin D and it hardly went up. Is that what to happened To begin with, you? yeah. Okay. Eventually it went up. Eventually yeah. it went up. So, but what, what happens in the background if, you, if people actually start running their active form, the calcitriol, the 125 dihydroxy colocalciferol, is they see that start going way up. That is the stuff that is calcifying them to an early death. And that is why, for those of you out there, if you're taking vitamin D and you're noticing yourself kind of over time getting stiff and achy and cracking and popping and everything just feels like it's creaking and slow in your system, including brain fog and all the hypothyroid symptoms, you're poisoning yourself with something that, what, what does vitamin D do? Let's go over what vitamin D does in the body for better or worse. When, what vitamin D is going to do in the system is it is going to raise your blood calcium. That is trying to raise the content of calcium in your blood. This doesn't always mean you're going to have super high blood calcium, like hypercalcemia. It just means it's trying to do that. That's what it tries to do. It's going to do this through one of two mechanisms. It is either going to increase the calcium absorption from your gut. Okay, that makes sense, right? It's going to trigger more calcium absorption from your gut. If, if there is more vitamin D triggering calcium absorption from your gut, if, it, if there's too much of that, or if there's not enough calcium for the vitamin D, where does it go? It goes to your bones. I posted research on Twitter showing 10 year studies on men taking vitamin D. They had lower bone density after 10 years than the people who didn't take vitamin D. And what are we told about vitamin D doing? Oh, it builds bone. No, it raises blood calcium and it will do it through pulling calcium out of the bones. You can go look up calcium resorption or bone resorption vitamin D on the internet. It's something that vitamin D is known to do. So the blood calcium is going to go up. Now, what happens when the blood calcium goes up? Some people will say, well, the body keeps the blood calcium under a very tight regulation or else you could get in big trouble. You could die All, or less, less intense things, but you could die. This is how vitamin D works in as a rodenticide, as killing mice and rats. It raises their blood calcium so high that they die. That is how it works. So it's going to do the same thing in people, but 
so your body can keep the very tight control of the blood calcium. If you, if you start getting too much calcium in there and your body wants to bring it back down, okay, we just pulled the calcium out of the bones. It's very unlikely the body's going to put it back there because the mechanism is pulling it out. It's constantly pulling it out if it's overstimulated. So where can the body shove the calcium? It can shove it into all of your soft tissues. It can shove it into your brain. It can shove it into your heart. It can shove it into your muscles. It can shove it into your ligaments and tendons. That's called arthritis, right? If you go and you look up almost any disease and you look up the radiology on it and you look up x-rays on it, why do people think they spot diseases on x-rays other than broken bones? Why does a, ma a mammogram an x-ray? What are they seeing in the breast? They're seeing calcium deposits. <laughs> this is how they spot. This is why they use, you know, CAT scans and they use x-rays is one of the things is they see is they see calcium deposits because calcium deposits go along with disease. And so the way that the body will keep the calcium steady in the blood is it will take the calcium out of the blood and put it into soft tissues. And so you just calcify yourself. And that's how, you, what, it, what one of the expressions I use is your body will always try to choose the slow death over the quick death. So if it doesn't get the calcium out of your blood, you're going to have a quick death. So it will choose the slow death of shoving the calcium into soft tissues so that you can live longer. And the body's hope is that eventually you'll stop doing it so that then you can get rid of that calcium through like having enough magnesium and other things like that. And so that would be gallstones and kidney stones as well, I guess. Oh, right? a lot of, well, most stones are going to be, they're going to have some form of calcium in them. Like people don't realize when they talk about atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease, I mean, how do they measure how, how blocked your coronary arteries are? The test is called your coronary calcium score. So people are like cholesterol and I'm like, well, cholesterol's part of it. It's just like your bones are not all calcium. Your bones are collagen and a, a matrix of protein holding minerals. So your atherosclerosis is calcium and cholesterol and other things. So it's all just building. It's like you need the, you have to have the bricks, which is the mineral. And then you have the mortar, which is something else. So yeah, everything they look at, it's like, it's calcium everywhere but they don't tend to talk about it. So does excess sunlight have that same effect or does it, have, does it not do that? One person. Well, first of all, there was a lot of people who were, and you were probably, you were probably aiming for a higher vitamin D than this when you were taking a lot of vitamin D because somebody convinced you that it was really healthy. Like long-term lifeguards in Australia, right? There's no ozone layer or whatever, you know, whatever that story is that was going on. Their vitamin D level on average was like 55. And you had people on the internet saying 70 and 90 and a hundred, even though the, I think somebody said 110 and it was like, you no, know, the, the diagnosed vitamin D toxicity is at a hundred for sure. And there's people shooting for higher than that. And I'm like, what are you doing? So I don't know. What were you shooting for when you were taking a lot of it? We use a different scale over here, but you're talking about nanogram uh, something, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? We, we use Mignol I don't like those or something. Conversions, I know. <laughs> But yeah, I, I, from what I understand, I believe it was like a hundred, uh, yeah. in your scale that they were recommending. Yes. So it's, it's really like, I just never understood that why once somebody brought up the, the lifeguard study and I went, how in the world do people think that going like way, way above guys who live in the sun, white guys who live in the sun is like some super healthy thing. I said, where's the data? Like I keep looking for this data on these super high vitamin D folks. And I, I never hear about it. Um, it's kind of like the people who push toxic organ meats. I'm like, where are the references on all of this organ meat being so healthy? Cause I have tons of references on organ meats being full of toxicity, but where's the research? I mean, I, I saw an ad on Instagram the other day, they're selling whole blood, whole cow blood extract, and then testicles as like male health. And I'm like, okay. I thought, we, I thought we figured out that testosterone isn't available by mouth from testicles a long time ago. Um, anyway, the, the vitamin D thing. Oh, there, so can you get too calcified from the sun? The only time I've seen evidence of that was, I think it was a study on Australian lifeguards again. 
But a guy sent me this thing. It was like the only time I've seen it. He said they said there may be some excess calcification in from these high levels of vitamin D. But still, it was natural sunlight vitamin D. So they were saying maybe because I used to say you can't get problems from from too much calcium from vitamin D from too much sunlight. I used to I used to claim that, and then somebody found one paper <laughs> that suggested otherwise. And then I went, well, okay, so let's think about why would this happen. Lifeguards are out in the sun all day, exerting themselves, sweating. Anybody who knows anything about magnesium knows magnesium is the biggest antagonist to excess calcium. We lose tons of magnesium under stress. Well, lifeguard jobs, they have their stress at times for sure. They're also very physically demanding. And in Australia, on the beach, you'd be sweating a ton and sweating causes you to lose magnesium. So maybe it wasn't the excess of vitamin D. It was just the lack of magnesium because of their job. And then they, they were getting a lot of sun, so they would have had more calcium in their systems. And then calcium, too much calcium will drive down um, magnesium. So, so just to explain, the reason why I did it at a time is because, you know, they claim it helps with autoimmunity. So now I'm wondering, is it because it actually suppresses the immune system that it might make some people feel better. Is that a theory that maybe makes sense? Or do you think there's a different reason why some people do feel better with it? No, there's, there's a definite reason. We, we haven't, um, I don't want to get too much into toxic bile theory until you're ready. Oh, let's do it. Let's go straight into it. Yeah, no, if okay. that leads into it, let's go for it. Okay, well, so we'll get, so I'm going to try to remind me if I forget to come back around to how vitamin D would then help autoimmunity. Because okay. once we understand toxic bile theory and we understand what vitamin D from the, oral does, then it'll make sense in terms of toxic bile theory and how it could help short term, but it'll make things worse long term. Okay. So a quick overview on toxic bile theory. <laughs> I'm like taking a big inhale so I can get started on it. Okay. People like to talk about the liver and detoxing. Okay. The, the, the mistake that people make about the idea of the liver and detoxing is they think that somehow toxins hit the liver and the liver does its magic on them and they just poof, disappear. Like they think it just means the liver just makes them disappear. That is absolutely not true. The liver can either, the liver will either put them straight into the bile. Like if it's, if it's uh, toxic metal, it doesn't do much to it. It's just going to put it in the bile. It's going to put it in the garbage can, if you will, or <laughs> the poop. If you, I call, I call the bile, the liver's poop. We'll get to that in a second. So it's either going to just put stuff straight into the bile or it's going to, to run it through what are called detox pathways and change its form. So then hopefully they, it can either turn it water soluble. It could go to the kidneys to leave, or the hope is you're turning it into a less toxic form, which could then be put in the bile. Or there's a thing called biotransformation or intoxication, intoxication. Instead of detoxification, it's intoxication. It's where when the liver runs a chemical through it, it actually becomes a more toxic molecule as it goes through detox. And then people say, why would that happen? Why would the body do this? Why would God design us to do this? Why? I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not the creator. I, I just observe it. So we have those things. So then how does the liver try? What is the best way the body has to get rid of these toxins? Well, it's the bile. The bile is the liver's poop. So the liver poops into the bile ducts. The bile ducts connect to the intestines, the small intestine. And then the small intestine is going to hopefully carry that out. Now, here's the, here's the rub. In most people, the, the standard American diet, it is stated that we are going to reabsorb. So, so this is the thing that people also make a mistake of. They think that like, your skin will only absorb good things and it will try to reject bad things. Like our skin has like some sentient choice. They'll also tend to think that the intestines will not absorb bad things and will only absorb good things. This is absolutely the furthest thing from the truth. Your intestines will absorb practically everything they can possibly absorb. Same thing with your skin. That's why I tell people like stuff you're putting on your skin. If you wouldn't eat it, you probably shouldn't be putting it on your skin because it's going to be in your blood. Like the sunscreen study where they put eight compounds from sunscreen on people's skin and then they measured them in the blood the next day and they saw all eight compounds in the blood the next day. 
So when you put sunscreen on your skin, you're not just putting it on your skin, you're putting it in your blood. So with the intestines, as that bile is going through them on the way, hopefully to be pooped out, 95% of the bile is reabsorbed through what's called the enterohepatic circulation. So entero is guts, hepatic liver. So it's, it's a specific circulation that's just from the guts to the liver. Think of it as it's like the entry into the nightclub. So it's, it's the, the bouncer is the liver. So for everything in the intestines that's coming into the system, it goes into the enterohepatic circulation, then it goes to the bouncer and the bouncer has to decide what to do with it. So you have this, this cycle, this enterohepatic circulation of bile and toxic stuff going into the guts. And then the guts are reabsorbing a lot of the toxic stuff and it's going right back to the liver. So then the liver has to do that dance again. Okay. So by definition, the bile is the most toxic fluid in the body. It is concentrated toxicity from the liver itself that the liver's trying to get rid of. Other people on the internet are like, they always talk about how wonderful the bile is and how much you need it and you have to thin it and you have to do all this stuff. And I'm like, look, we just want the bile to be, we, the liver will do what it's supposed to do. If we just make it less toxic, we help it get rid of the toxins it's already stored because your liver does store toxins. If you ever want to look it up on PubMed or look in the scientific research, they use the term accumulate. They don't ever use the word store. So search for the word accumulate or accumulation, and you'll start to find all sorts of stuff that the liver holds on to. So then, and then the last thing is we try to put in the nutrients that the body needs to protect itself and to get rid of the toxins. That's like basically how we restore health. And all of those things together will help fix the bile problem that I'm about to describe. Let me give one example of one component of bile, which is vitamin A as retinoic acid. Your body wants to get rid of vitamin A. It stores it in the liver if it can't get rid of it fast enough. It stores it in the body fat if it can't get, fast, get rid of it fast enough. It'll store it in the skin if it can't get rid of it fast enough. That's why people turn orange. And now people have sent me videos of liposuction doctors sucking out orange fat from people. Like there's vitamin A being stored everywhere. Fatty liver is yellow. What colors vitamin A? It's yellow. Like there's a vitamin A toxicity epidemic everywhere. So, and I've shown the data on that too. So vitamin A, what does it break down to? What does it biotransform into or intoxify into? It intoxifies or, or biotransforms into retinoic acid, multiple forms. But one of the most common forms that especially women know about is retinoic acid in terms of retin-A or what is called a yellow chemical peel. Note they say the color in it. So they would put this chemical peel on people's faces and it was basically going to dissolve several of the upper layers, the upper, upper cell layers. And then it's going to in, it's going to speed up the turnover of cells underneath it so that people get a little nicer skin for a while. That's it. So it's, it's a big, big, huge trade. Now I want you to think about if your cells were turning over too quickly over and over and over again. Wouldn't that be called accelerated aging, right? So can't, can't you do something short term that like, like people using caffeine, short term caffeine may give you some energy. Long term, it makes you more tired. Well, if we were doing something to speed up the turnover of the skin, so we look a little younger short term, long term, it's going to age us. That's you, there, there is no something for nothing, but anyway, back to retinoic acid, it's dissolving cell layers. So. Bile. Bile is how we get rid of vitamin A. Bile containing retinoic acid contains a chemical peel. This bile then, it can, dis it can bust holes, dissolve holes in, eat holes in the liver cells that make the bile. I have that research. It can dissolve holes in the little teeny tiny bile ducts in the liver. Those two things together are called intrahepatic cholestasis, which means you are leaking bile from the liver itself directly into the bloodstream. I thought cholestasis is where the bile was uh, like stuck. It's not moving. Oh, so, okay. So cola is related to bile, right? Stasis is stagnation. That's the, that's the strict definition of it. However, stagnation can also be in this term that basically it means bile is going to the wrong places. Kind of like if a river wasn't flowing, it will be stagnant, but if it stops flowing long enough, it's going to back up the river right? And find other places to flow. It's going to, it's going to find the quickest way down. 
So the bile so will both, do that but too. the more troubling thing is that it's going into the bloodstream. Yes. So intrahepatic cholestasis means leaking directly from the liver into the bloodstream. It's not even making it to the what's called the big common bile duct, the big one. Like you think of your aorta or something like that. It's the big one. So the common bile duct can get holes eaten in it. The this bile goes down there. Everybody in the alternative community is talking about leaky gut, right? But they never seem to have a good explanation of what is eating the holes in the gut. Well, I could tell you, I found research showing that the bile controls the tightness of the junctions in the gut. So the bile controls leaky gut. Bile is the cause of leaky gut. And then we get ulcers in our stomachs. Well, if you start looking at the research of acid reflux and bile reflux, which nobody ever talks about, the bile is eating the holes in the stomach. And I actually have research showing that this, because the stomach's made to absorb things, right? The stomach is absorbing um, bile. If, if bile goes up into the stomach, which is if you've got GERD or acid reflux and whatever you're doing is not working, it's because it's a bile problem and you're not fixing that problem. The stomach can absorb the bile directly through itself. I've got research on that. We're going to take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today. I think just to add something into that, I think the evidence for that is the fact that you also get duodenal ulcers because they say that the reason that the stomach gets ulcers is because the acid is so uh, acidic that it's burning holes in it. But the duodenum has a pH of about six to eight when I looked it up. So, so why is that getting holes burnt into it if it wasn't the bile? Right, right. And isn't the stomach designed for stomach acid? Like that's what it's designed to hold. That's that's the thing I I tell people about how bad it is that the bile is getting so toxic that it's ruining gallbladders. Like the gallbladder is designed to hold bile, but anything that you have enough of in it, it, it can damage it. But the, if we look into um, a lot of those acid, in, those acid inhibitors, the acid blockers that are for GERD, they, they shut down bile production. So if you shut down bile production, there's no bile going back up into the stomach you don't have a GERD problem anymore, right? So it's it's really funny how it all, when we start looking into what drugs do and a lot of the things that I say are not good for people do, including vitamin D by mouth, it slows down bile production and it reduces what I call bile dumping. So, okay, so let's get back into that. So now we have all these ways, It's and just for, for people who go out and look and they say, well, my doctor says I don't have this, well, there's a very distinct term for what you can have, which is called subclinical cholestasis, which is where the doctors can't find it or they say your, your numbers aren't high enough to have it. But how many of us have gone to doctors and said, I know I have this problem. The doctor's like, no, you don't have it. It's all in your head. They, they gaslight us all the time telling us we're not sick or we don't have that when everything we have matches it. So, but when you start to understand toxic bile theory that this when people talk about toxicity causing disease, this is the main way that the toxicity is getting into your blood. It is your liver's doing its job of collecting toxins and putting it into the bile. The bile is then, we don't want it to, but the bile is super toxic and then it starts eating holes in things and leaking into your bloodstream. So now, as I've shown before in all in a lot of my live streams about specific diseases, I can show that 
Often there's either higher bile in the blood of people with certain diseases, or there's a different recipe of the bile in the blood of different diseases. So those are the two things that cause problems. Like I have, I have a study showing diabetics have twice as much bile in their blood as controls. And then every week I show different patterns. There was specific patterns of hypothyroid versus hyperthyroid versus people on thyroid medications. So we just, we show it over and over again. So that is what that, that's just the bile. That's not even going into the toxic metals and the copper toxicity and the vitamin A toxicity. I mean, retinoic acid floating around in your blood, it dissolves cells. Hmm. Your blood goes everywhere. So how can these diseases show up? How can we have the, what, what I'm saying is that this toxic bile theory is pretty much accounting for potentially all chronic diseases. It just shows up differently in different people because they've got a different bile recipe. They've got different other toxins in their bile. There's genetics. There's nutritional deficiencies that can be different in each person that are either protecting them or not protecting them. So we look at this and it just shows up in different. And then there's, you know, I mean, the genetics thing, like if you have a genetics weakness, a weak link in your chain, the same as your mom and the same as her grandma, then that's probably what's going to break in you first because here's the sad thing, folks. Toxicities are handed down. So we're handing down toxicities to each generation. And if the mother's nutrient deficient, you can assume that the child will be nutrient deficient. So we're handing down these toxicities and deficiencies. And then people wonder why they'll say, well, my grandpa ate like this every day and he lived to be 90. And then, then you say, well, he handed that toxicity that he did. He may have lived that long, but he handed it down to your dad and your dad probably didn't fix it. He probably made it worse. And now he handed it down to you. And this is why you can't do the same things that your grandpa did necessarily once we figure those things out. So with that toxic bile theory, it's just vitamin D in some people, they take it. It slows down their bile production. They feel better because if, if, if you think of it as a leaky sink, if you turn off the sink, there's no more leak, right? Or if you turn down the sink, the leak goes down because there's just less pressure. So if you reduce the bile production and dumping, you can see the symptoms go down. A lot of people do this. They don't realize what they're doing. And I'm not saying this is a, I'm not, I'm not putting a, a complete value judgment, good or bad on this, but a lot of people, when they feel better fasting, right, they're not eating anything. Does your body have any reason to dump bile if you're not eating? No, no, there's Other no detoxifying, but the. It, it's mainly released in response to the food, right? Especially fat. Sort food of and fat and, stuff. and soluble fiber and stress. So if you're fasting and let's say you're not stressing, you're relaxing, you're off on your retreat, you know, or whatever, and you're drinking water and you're not eating, there is no reason to dump bile. So what happens is you don't dump as much bile. Your liver gets a chance to clean up the bile that's in the blood that's been causing all your symptoms. And people are like, oh, my eczema is going away oh, this is going away. My brain is so clear. And then what happens when they start eating again? It all just comes right back because you start pumping the bile. It starts going into your blood again. You reach that same level of toxicity. And then, you know, maybe if you do it enough, the, the one theory I have on fasting that may work long-term is that you did give the, the, the burned out holes, you know, the, the leakiness, a chance to heal. But also you're not eating, which is the materials you need to heal. So eh, anyway. And maybe slowing down your metabolism, right? I mean, starvation in, in populations who have been monitored for starvation, they hand down epigenetically starvation-related adaptations to the next generation. So, I mean... Just because somebody doesn't want to eat doesn't necessarily mean it's the healthiest thing they can do. So just to go back, for people watching this, a lot of people are like, does this apply to me? Is there a way of testing? Because you talked about different bile uh, things in the blood. I, I, I imagine because it's something that, well, first of all, we're just kind of assuming this. So just to clarify, this is not something that medical science recognizes, right? But it is something Well, that, they recognize intrahepatic cholestasis. They do recognize intrahepatic cholestasis and extrahepatic cholestasis, and they will... There's even papers saying that if you have high liver enzymes, AST, ALT, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff, that you have cholestasis. 
There you go. So that. that is a, a reliable indicator of that it's getting quite bad. The uh, there's, there's cholestasis. many many potential indicators. Ferritin is one. Yeah, please tell us what they um, are. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I some of these I don't even. Well, let, let me let me kind of back up on that before I go into it. So if you're asking, is there a good test for it? Or any test, several tests, you know, because you talked about different types of bile and stuff. Yeah. So in the in the US, there is a test from lab. I, I use this a big lab here called LabCorp. And there's a test where they te they do four different bile acids. And then they, they give you the, the amounts for each of them. And then they give you a total. And then there's another test called total bile acids which is two different bile acids combined into one test. So you can technically get six, you can get a, an amount of six different bile acids. Now, in the research that I've seen, there are at least 56 different bile acids. So it would be like if you had a recipe with 56 ingredients and they only told you six. You're not getting the whole recipe. And... So we're kind of missing out on that. Now I can tell you that I've, I've monitored my bile acids before and I've, I've tracked them several times. And in my recent one, my most recent one, which I'm, I'm going to be doing a labs video here in the near future. I'm just waiting. I was going to do another set of labs to update something. I have almost no bile acids in my blood and I've gotten rid of the problems of my past, like the chronic insomnia and the prostate issues and the, the tinea versicolor. And I've gotten rid of all of these things over the, over the years. I mean, I've been doing this for five and a half years now. So one would think that if vitamin A was so crucial, I, I should be, I should not be able to see, right? Because you need vitamin A for your eyes and your night blindness. And yet I go and I, I shoot guns in competitions, which is a very eye intensive activity. And I drive fine at night. I take night vision classes with guns. So it's not like. It's just not happening. And I don't have skin issues. Actually, people, when they feel my skin, they, they ask me what kind of moisturizer I use. And I don't, I don't touch moisturizer. So all these things that vitamin A deficiency supposedly causes, I don't have any problem with. So just to clarify, five and a half years with zero uh, vitamin not A. Zero, no, intake. you cannot have zero vitamin A. You cannot. It is not, it is not possible. Okay. Um, actually, some guy just tried to say that I've been saying a zero vitamin A diet, and I've never said that. Grant and I have both never said that. It is completely impossible. So what's the lowest level you can achieve, would you say? I actually haven't ever calculated that because they'll, they'll say that, um, like, okay, I'll get a study on reindeer meat and it'll say, here's the amount of vitamin A in the meat. And then you get a study from the USDA on beef and it says there's zero vitamin A in the beef and you know that the farmers are feeding them vitamin A and it's just like, so there's something very wrong with the calculations actually recently, as an example, a study came out on fatty liver. The old studies on fatty liver used to say that the, the fatty liver was vitamin A deficient. There was almost no vitamin A in it of people. And then another study came out, I think it was about 2010, where they said, um, we did a different way of analyzing the liver fat for the vitamin A. And they're like, there's an insane amount of vitamin A in here. So they, they just analyzed it wrong. And so they gave everybody this bad impression. So, but it, the, the vitamin A stuff it's yeah, to, to figure out, I mean, Grant did his prison diet. He calls it his prison diet. It was beef and beans and well, uh, beef or bison, uh, black beans and, um, either white or brown rice, depending upon the day. And he would take all those, he'd make them all in the morning for the day. And he would basically just combine them in a bowl and add some hot water and he ate them like a soup. So it really seemed like a prison diet. <laughs> It's like you get your gruel and, but he's been eating that three times a day for like nine years now, no butter, no, no vitamin A foods. And he's fine. He even did an experiment where I think him and another guy, they kept like a gerbil or a hamster or, or, or alive for 120 days on like basically the closest they could come to a zero vitamin A diet. And they're just, we're just showing it. I, I put a study on Twitter the other day where they put cattle on a, they called it a restricted vitamin A diet. They didn't add any vitamin A to their feed. And after seven months, none of the cattle had any problems at all. So it just seems to be that this is not what it does for some reason. All the studies on vitamin A deficiency 
where they say, oh, vitamin A deficiency, and we gave vitamin A and these things got better. It is always in malnourished people like Africa. There's some, some bridge that vitamin A covers when people are severely malnourished. Okay. But the funny thing is, is I've shown the research where when they feed these malnourished people zinc, their vitamin A levels in the blood go up. When they feed these malnourished people more protein, their vitamin A levels go up. And then taurine actually has been shown to help with a lot of the problems associated with supposed vitamin A deficiency. What does red meat have in it? Zinc and taurine and a lot of protein. What do we think that maybe these African countries are not getting enough of? Meat, maybe? I mean, isn't it kind of an assumption in severely malnourished places? You go, well, they're not getting any meat for sure. They're eating like just grains. So we start to show that this is probably not a vitamin and that maybe we were either accidentally misled or purposely misled into thinking it's a vitamin. And then when, when, we, when we know that retinoic acid is the active form of it and the pharmaceutical world sells us the three quote unquote active forms of vitamin A as retinoic acid, they sell us retin-A which there was a study on U.S. veterans where they put Retin-A on every day to try to prevent skin cancer. They had to stop the study because too many of them were dying. There's Accutane, and if people don't know about the trail of bodies that Accutane has left, you just have to look. And then the last one, so that was, that was all trans-retinoic acid. They find that in humans who eat vitamin A. It's found in your blood. You don't have to be taking Retin-A to have all trans-retinoic acid in your blood. And the big mistake that a lot of the pseudoscientific health gurus will say is they'll say, well, all trans retinoic acid from natural sources is somehow different than all trans retinoic acid from synthetic sources. That's not science at all, because how do the scientists identify all trans retinoic acid? They use the exact same techniques. It's the same molecule. And then if they're saying, oh, well, it's the other stuff in the food that protects you from it, then you just said that it's bad. You just said that it's bad and you need something to protect you from it. Like they, they can't get out of these arguments. <laughs> so then, so all trans retinoic acid is retin-A or tretinoin. Uh, 13 cis retinoic acid is accutane or isotretinoin. And then alitretinoin is nine cis retinoic acid. And it is, it is used mainly as chemotherapy. <laughs> and we all know chemotherapy is, is super good for us. Right. And then often, the retinoic acid, all three of those retinoic acids are actually used as chemotherapy. And they often combine all trans retinoic acid with arsenic as a chemotherapy. So I, I tend to like to say uh, poisons of a feather flock together. Um, they're not using something nutritional in combination with arsenic. They're just combining two poisons for a more synergistic killing effect. Now, I could show you that vitamin A reduces bile production as well. So then we have people who are saying, oh, I started taking vitamin A and I got better. Okay. What? So if I say these things are poisons and people can say, oh, I started taking an SSRI and I got better. I started taking a benzodiazepine, an anti-anxiety med, and I got better. I started doing chemo. to go full circle. Right. I start taking vitamin D3. And well, I mean, I mean, the, yeah. So we have, it is normal in conventional medicine and even a lots of alternative medicine to use toxic substances for short-term benefits. That's the whole basis of, of pharma pharmacy, right? They're going to use a, a known toxin that has side effects to stop some process in the body. That's, that's what they do. So when I say vitamin A is stopping some process in the body and it's a toxin and vitamin D is stopping some process in the body and it's a toxin, and I can show that by when I get people off of them and we do the right things long term, like what do you, what do you need if we said vitamin D was something we need and that was something that is, that is good. If we, if we made that assumption, which I'm still okay with, I'm not, I, I, I have not put my foot down on the vitamin D in the body that is made there. I do not like people taking vitamin D, but what will raise vitamin D in the blood that's not vitamin D. Well, zinc will do it. Magnesium will do it. 
more, there, more protein will do it. There was a study where, where they gave dogs like just dairy protein. And then, there was, then another group of dogs got actual animal protein. And then they were trying to induce rickets in them. And in the dogs who got the meat, they couldn't induce rickets. So we start going, meat seems to be a really important part of this. Because we got zinc again, right? Zinc shows up again. And then for vitamin A, to raise vitamin A, we got zinc and protein and taurine. And taurine is only found in muscle meat, but particularly in red meat. So we start going, wow, red meat sure is fixing a lot of these deficiency problems. But what, what do they, the they is in quotes, what do they want to take away from us and not have us eat anymore? They're trying to take away meat. If you wanted to damage humanity, that would be an amazing way to do it. And so I'm just showing the research on it. So just to play devil's advocate, you know, so many people do say that they feel better on a vegan diet, uh, sometimes a vegetarian diet. So why would you say that is based on, is it the same mechanism again? Or is there something else Yeah, we, else could, we could go into um, theory. It depends on, okay, so there's junk food vegans out there, right? They just live on chips and just garbage. But let's say someone who eats a lot of fruits and vegetables and because they believe that's the healthiest thing. We, we've all known people who are vegans who were wasting away and we watch them get sicker and sicker before our eyes. We've all seen that. And I'm not, I'm not against that. There are some people who do not need as much muscle meat to be healthy, or maybe they hardly need any at all. Maybe they don't even need any. Those are not the common person. There's always freaks like, and I don't mean that in a bad way. There's always people at the end of the spectrum and they can do things that seemingly would make almost everybody else sick. I, do, I, I deal with these people. I deal with the sickest of the sick people. And if I have somebody tell me, it's very, it's somebody, I, I, people tell me this all, you know, not often, but they come to me and they say, doc, I don't feel good when I eat red meat. Do I have to eat it? And I say, no, you don't. If you don't feel good on it, then don't eat it. So, you know, the only, uh, I have some people who barely eat any meat. But they have come to that conclusion through the experimentation. And if they came to me saying, Doc, I'm not hardly eating any meat and I'm getting weaker and I'm losing weight and I'm losing strength, I'd be like, um, maybe you should probably eat more meat. You know, that, that would be like the first thing. So what would you recommend for protein for those uh, minority of people? Because you're not going to recommend dairy, presumably. You're not going to recommend eggs, presumably. Well, eggs, egg, actually, okay, so let me tell you a funny story about how we how we tailor things to somebody in this program. Uh, I, I went over a testimonial, I think it was two live streams ago. And this woman is severely copper toxic and probably quite vitamin A toxic. She started finding that she was unable, she could not take any supplemental zinc. It would send her into all sorts of what we call copper toxicity symptoms. Then she started figuring out she didn't tolerate red meat and she assumed it was the zinc. So then we were, I was like, well, let's try to get some zinc. So let's do dark meat, poultry, dark meat, chicken, stuff like that. She did. She was like, I still, it's better, but I still don't feel great. I was like, okay, well, let's do chicken breast. Less, uh, less zinc in there. She went to that. She felt a bit better. She felt pretty good for a while. And then she started saying, well, they're kind of creeping back again. I said, okay, well, if you want to do some egg whites, not egg yolks, egg yolks are where all the vitamin A is, right? It's, it's yellow. It tells you. So the egg white, I was like, I don't love egg whites because they're high in sulfur. Sulfur slows your detox. Regardless of what anybody on the internet tells you, sulfur slows your detox. So she started doing some egg whites and then she started doing fine. And then after a while, she started realizing that, oh, she could start. So what I do with people is I say, sometimes you can be so toxic that you can't do what we normally do. And so what we have to do, um, this is amazing. And I'm, I'm being like tongue in cheek with this, but I, I don't know why more doctors don't do this. I said, you have to listen to your body. If your body says, don't eat this, don't eat this, don't eat this, don't eat this. You can only eat this for a while, but you're following the general principles that we do. This problem will eventually go away and you'll be able to start re-adding these foods. This woman listened to me. She came to my office hours, which is where I help people at private, private clients. I have like a small group session where we're troubleshooting. And she came to those like almost every week and we were troubleshooting 
and I, I, she just slowly started bringing stuff back in and now she's doing, you know, chicken and dark meat chicken. And she's doing little bits. Like she said, an eighth of a cup of beef, like three days a week and it's working for her. So she's able to start re adding the zinc stuff back in. I had a woman where one of the few things she could eat, she was only, she could eat like three things. And one of them was mangoes, which are very high in vitamin A. So she comes to me and I'm like, if you don't eat, you're going to starve. She said, what about the mangoes? Like, is that a big problem? And I said, you got to eat. Like you can't not eat. Um, not eating is a quick road to death. <laughs> so let's eat. And she even commented on, on my network and the forum and was saying like, this is all I can eat. She was trying to get help. I, I told her to come to the office hours. Cause like, I'm like, you got me come, come to me. Don't, don't come. I mean, I love the people in the network, but I'm kind of the expert. So I said, come to me if you're like really complicated, but other people in the network were saying, well, you got to get off the mango. You got to get off the mango. And she's like, but it's only three things that I can eat. And what else am I going to eat? And I said, you are to eat what you tolerate, do the best you can get your protein for now, fix everything else that you can. And then over time, you'll be able to wean off the mango because you'll be able to get more foods in your diet. And that's exactly what happened. So this is a big thing for people who work with me is there are things I call band-aids or crutches. Like this lady had a crutch. It was mangoes. She needed to eat. She needed a crutch. Her leg was broken in a cast, so she couldn't walk around normally. So I said, okay, we're going to do all the other things to help it heal. You're going to keep the crutches until you start feeling like we're going to get the cast off and you can start rehabbing it and you can start putting weight on it and you can start walking on it. And then eventually you could start jogging on it and then you can start running on it. And that's, that's just how we do things. I don't understand why so many other practitioners don't listen to their patients or they assume their patients are lying. It seems like most uh, practitioners of all kinds have a dogmatic idea that they're trying to fit their patients into rather than actually listening. Uh, I'd love to just uh, ask you about sulfur that you just mentioned, because yet again, it is something experimental that I, I cannot stand any sulfurous foods. Um, they, they seem like a and so I've had different people tell me different things. Some people tell me it's because I have a hydrogen sulfide SIBO, but I haven't found that. Some people tell me it's because it creates, uh, uh, it stimulates uh, heavy metal detoxification. But, you know, your perspective is that sulfur is just something that slows down. Well, you tell me what's, what's bad about sulfur, please. Well, it's the, the simple explanation and what I've found is, and this is not hard to find in the research, is that sulfur slows down an, a critical enzyme to detox called ALDH or aldehyde dehydrogenase. This is not hidden in the literature. It's very easy to find. And when you slow down aldehyde dehydrogenase, two things tend to happen. One, you create a bottleneck and you're going to accumulate aldehydes in your system. And one of the things I've added to my live streams where I show the toxicity is I'll show in all of these diseases, there's high aldehydes. Like with ALS, they could cause ALS just by giving people, exposing people to excessive amounts of formaldehyde in workplaces, just formaldehyde. But then they measure in, in them also as well. People are very anti-PUFAs and I'm anti-PUFAs, but I simply just tell people like minimize your added oils. Then you get rid of the seed oil problem. You get rid of the fish oil problem. You get rid of all the oil problems because they're adding minimal amount. I mean, they're trying to eat whole foods, not like all these bottled sauces that are full of seed oils and stuff, but I'm not a seed oil crusader. I don't have to be because I just say minimize your added fats. Like that's, that's the whole industrial seed oil problem was adding fats to things, right? So we just, we just simplify it. I mean, there's no reason to believe that humans have to add fats to things to be healthy. That's not very naturalistic, right? So what do PUFAs turn into that nobody talks about? They oxidize into malondialdehyde. No one talks about malondialdehyde. Or they might talk about it, but they never talk about where it comes from. It comes from PUFAs. But then you have to have ALDH to detox those. So then if you're getting a lot of sulfur and slowing down your ALDH, you're not detoxing malondialdehyde. You're not detoxing formaldehyde. You're not detoxing oxygen. So every bit of sugar you eat just about is going to eventually turn into a little bit of is it going to turn into ethanol, alcohol. And I'm not saying carbs are bad. I'm not saying that. We have detox mechanisms for it, but drinking alcohol is a surely a way to overload that. So a little bit of the carbs you eat turns into 
ethanol, which then turns into acetaldehyde. So you have to be able to get rid of acetaldehyde too. And that's if you drink alcohol, boy, you're really just stressing the ALDH. So that part. Oh, and vitamin A. If you eat beta carotene, one beta carotene molecule gets chopped by the body into two retinaldehydes. Nobody ever talks about how vitamin A is an aldehyde. And there's an alcohol form that's retinol. And then there's an aldehyde form called retinaldehyde, but they try to hide it from you in the literature by calling it retinal. They don't call it retinaldehyde because aldehydes actually scare people and retinal doesn't. And when you search for retinal on like PubMed, you get things that are related to the retina. You look, you, you find retinal because it's the same word. So they can kind of hide it from you. So <laughs> amazing. We had, so that's one thing sulfur does is it slows down ALDH. Another thing that's known to help with enzymes like sulfite oxidase, which is something that helps your sulfur processing and helps with ALDH and aldehyde, de ox sorry, aldehyde oxidase, that's another aldehyde enzyme, is you need molybdenum. And nobody ever talks about molybdenum, but molybdenum is an absolutely critical mineral to your entire detox system. And I supplement it regularly in my people. Now just know you can't overdo it. So if you don't know what you're doing and you're just going out there and trying to supplement it and you, you cause yourself a problem, well, just because I said the word molybdenum doesn't mean I'm responsible for your problem that you caused. But yeah, molybdenum is known to help with sulfur problems. Like for people who drink wine and they get particularly bad symptoms from drinking wine versus other types of alcohol, you're not processing the sulfites because you don't have enough molybdenum. But what, how else does this connect? How else does sulfur connect to bile then? Toxic bile theory. Okay, well, let's back up one second. If you slow down bile production and bile dumping over time, think of it as like the water behind the dam, the bile behind the dam is slowly building, right? It's, you're building up toxicity. If you're not getting rid of the bile, you're not getting rid of the toxicity. And so you're just building stuff up. It's like, it's like the shower drain that keeps getting, let's say you have a lady in the house with long hair and you keep getting long hair in the drain and the drain, it's still the same amount of water. It's still the same amount of showering, but now there's more and more hair in the drain and the hair is now collecting soap and shampoo on it. So it's getting thicker and it just starts slowly plugging the drain more and more. The drain drains slower and then you build up water in the, in the shower faster until it's overflowing the shower and you have water all over your bathroom causing diseases, right? So this is where slowing down the bile short term, people don't notice it. Maybe they even feel better. Slowing it down long term, it is going to burst the dam, whether that's the liver cells or the small bile ducts or the big bile ducts or the leaky gut or the stomach or wherever your bile goes. We don't know why it goes certain directions. It just does. So that is... um. So back to the ALDH, sulfur slows ALDH. Well, what I have seen in the, I haven't spelled all this out in the research yet, but what I have seen is when you slow down ALDH, you slow down bile production. Ah, interesting. So therefore you, you're slowing down ALDH detox and you're slowing down bile production. And then eventually you get problems. Sometimes the problems may show up like a lot of people like yourself, let's say you eat sulfur and you don't feel good. Like your system is probably right on the verge. And if you like, if you slow down ALDH too much, you go past some threshold and you're like, I don't feel good. Like it's right away. Like me with vitamin D, I used to just the next morning after I took vitamin D, I would, I would first, I'd have to pee all night. I'd wake up, I'd be stiff as a board. Um, I, I couldn't sleep well. Like it's, I I'm, I'm kind of if you want to call it, I'm not, I'm not sensitive, but I, you know, I'm a sensitive type where if I take things, I'm very good at observing what they do to me. And I just, I know I found, I figured out a lot of supplements are bad for me are bad for people by how quickly they affect me because I'm just like a lightning rod for that. Um, and then I get a lot of feedback from other people about how these things work. And as we get people better, they tolerate more sulfur. Not that, not that we want them to, we don't want them to try to tolerate sulfur, but all of a sudden they're like, <laughs> Oh, I had a glass of wine and I didn't get a headache the next day. And my ears didn't turn red. I used to, when I used to, I used, I've had all these problems. I used to drink a glass of wine and I'd turn into like, if you can imagine me on like wine where I'm getting a little irritated and I want to argue for hours 
oh, I was, I was like a bulldog and my ears would be bright red. And I wake up the next morning with a not fun hangover. And I finally just went, wine is not for me. And then now I know why at the time, I mean, not, not that alcohol is good for anybody, but I was like, why does wine make me feel crappy? And it's the sulfites. And here in America, we require, of course, because we have to poison Americans more. We require sulfites to be added to foreign wines. And I don't know if they're required to be added to American wines too, but we'd add more sulfites. Whereas sulfites are naturally occurring in wine. Like if you look at organic wine, it will say contain sulfites, but that's from the grapes themselves. We here in Merca, we like to add more sulfites to them. So we poison our people even more. <laughs> And so then, uh, some people naturally have slower aldehyde gene as oh, well, yes. right? Like, oh gosh, yes. Um, it's been said that fifty percent of the Asian overall Asian population has a genetic polymorphism where they are genetically slow in ALDH. Now that can be a huge scale, like it's a sliding spectrum. But uh, yeah, absolutely. People and I'm one of those people. Oh. And so when I heard you say about the sulfur, it made so much sense to me. So yeah. There you <laughs> go. So, so yeah, if you know you're, you're genetically slow with ALDH and then you take something that slows the ALDH further, you very quickly cross some threshold and you feel worse. Like this hmm. is, I mean, I really appreciated the, the compliment you gave me at the start where, where I was putting these things together and they were making sense based on what you'd experienced and what you'd seen. And that is actually the highest compliment that people give me, they'll tell me that like what you told me finally made things made, make sense. And I was like, yeah. they had to make sense to me first because I'm trying to, I was trying to figure out all this stuff for my health and I had to make it make sense to me. Now I know one of the things we do know is that smart people are very good at justifying their actions through all sorts of reasons. But for whatever reason, I just kept cutting through the muck to really try to find it instead of just saying, well, this is the way it is. And I'm going to believe this forever. That's, I guess that's what I do is I just kind of go, I'm always open to being wrong. It doesn't happen very often because I'm, I don't tend to commit to ideas until I've really had them marinate for a while, but it does happen like vitamin D vitamin A. And then thinking that flush niacin or nicotinic acid was bad was another big thing that I've turned 180 on. The other forms of niacin, I don't think people should take, but nicotinic acid and flesh niacin are very, very helpful. And I, I totally turned around on that after a woman named Kelsey Kenny came into the love your liver program and, and educated me on it. And I was open to it and I went, maybe I do have this wrong. And so then we, I changed course again on that. <laughs> so why, why is this one of the three big ones for you? Why is uh, nicotinic acid so important? So yeah, I'm going to refer to it. If I say niacin here, I mean nicotinic acid or flush niacin only. I do not mean niacinamide. I do not mean any of the other things out there on the market. Well, what Kelsey came and educated me to was that the importance of what's called NAD, which is one of the, the cellular energy form, you know, I just, it's part of the cellular energy process. She educated me about the necess the necessity of NAD to run here, get this ALDH. So like minerals, you need to run ALDH. You need selenium. Funny that popped up again and you need, um, molybdenum. So you need think I, the way I kind of explain it is those minerals are like parts of the engine of ALDH. Like they're the actual parts of the engine and then nicotinic acid. Well, NAD really, but nicotinic acid is the best and least expensive most efficient producer of NAD in the body. So nicotinic acid is the gasoline for the engine. Simple as that. So if you have great parts in your engine, but you have no gasoline, you're not going to get as far as fast. And if you have tons of gasoline, but the parts of your engine are deficient or suck, things are not going to go as well. So once I was educated to that, and then I started to see some of the patterns of I don't, I I'll explain it here. I'm going to, I'm going to explain this just because I want to, when I started to understand what vitamin A toxicity and detox looked like, and then I understood what a niacin, the quote unquote niacin flush looked like from flush niacin. And then I understood once, once I was educated to the type of niacin that they fortify foods with, when you see niacin on your bread label, which try not to buy that bread. But when you see niacin on your bread label, it's niacinamide, 
When you see niacin on your multivitamin, it's niacinamide. When you see niacin on your green drink and it puts you know, all these like all in one supplements or your protein shake, it's niacinamide. Nobody uses flush niacin partially because it's good for you, but partially because they don't want people to flush because if you don't know it's coming, then you think you're having an allergic reaction to it when it's not that at all. Actually, we have studies on nicotinic acid helping to shut down allergic reactions. Anaphylactic, it's a specifically, they, they mentioned anaphylactic reactions in mice and it was slowing down the effects of it. So let me just go over the, the connections that I put together based on all the stuff I've learned. So when in the old stories, well, then this, this still happens, but like, you know, everybody knows that you can get vitamin A toxicity from eating like, let's say polar bear liver or seal liver or the, or carnivore liver. Carnivore livers are so toxic with vitamin A. So if you eat too much of that liver, you'll get vitamin A toxicity. Well, what are some of the biggest symptoms of vitamin A toxicity, like acute short-term vitamin A toxicity, like somebody ate too much polar bear liver and the next day or two weeks they're having these reactions. They get red. Their skin turns red. They get itchy, tingly, painful skin, and then eventually they peel. It's called desquamation. So that is acute vitamin A toxicity. But then we also have to understand that it's the detox process. Like the body's trying to detox all that mega amount of vitamin A that went to the skin. And as it changes the form of the vitamin A in the skin, as it oxidizes it or runs it through the detox pathways to send it to the liver, as it goes through the different forms, you go through those different stages, the redness, the pain, the, the, the eventually the peeling. So even if we just thought of redness and peeling, if you, if you just thought of that as two stages, redness and then the redness is that the retinoic acid stage that burns the causes of the peeling? probably retinaldehyde that's the redness okay because we store it as retinol in the body fat Ret and retinol is bound to a fatty acid ester that's where like retinol palmitate people have heard of that that's it's stored in the fat as a fatty acid ester break off the ester and then the retinol would then go into retinaldehyde and then that would go through aldh and turn into retinoic acid and then go to the um the liver. Now, Accutane is very associated with causing all sorts of dryness all over the body. And Accutane is a retinoic acid. So it's probably the stages that it's going through. And it can go through them in the skin. Like your body cells have ADH and, and ALDH in them. So do like probiotics. So that's part of how some probiotics may help some people is they bring in some ADH and ALDH, which I didn't talk about ADH yet. But that breaks down alcohols. So, so let's go into sunburn. What does the sun do to vitamin A in your skin? Just like it does to make supposedly vitamin D is it oxidizes things. So vitamin D is a cholesterol at the skin oxidized. It goes into the system. Vitamin A in your skin, which if you don't know vitamin A is stored in your skin, I mean, if you've ever seen somebody eat too much carrot juice or carrots and they turn orange or yellow, that's vitamin A in their skin. So the sun, there was, there was a woman who put on carrot oil to tan with a UK woman. She put on carrot oil all over her body. She got third degree burns from being out in the sun in the UK. Vitamin A is terrible for your skin. There was another study where they put retinol, retinol palmitate in sunscreen, and then they exposed these mice with the sunscreen or with the vitamin A sunscreen. The rats who had the vitamin A in the sunscreen got tumors faster and bigger than the other rats. So the sun plus vitamin A in your skin is not good, but it does help oxidize it, which when I say oxidize vitamin A, it's sending it through the detox stages, but vitamin A is a biotransformation when it actually turns into more toxic things as it goes through the detox stages. Retinoic acid is way more toxic than beta carotene. As an example, beta carotene being the plant vitamin A. So what happens in a sunburn? Let's just hit those two big phases, which is redness and there's, there's pain and there's itching and then eventually peeling. It looks exact. And it's like two weeks, you know, a week or two before it's over. The vitamin A toxicity was about a week or two before it was over before the, the hard part was over that part. So it's funny that acute vitamin A toxicity and detox and a sunburn look exactly the same, right? 
So then what does the niacin flush look like? Your skin will get red or pink. You'll get itchy. At the very beginning, you might get a little bit of peel, a little bit of dry skin, but that goes away fairly quickly. So we just sped up the detox enzymes for vitamin A by giving them nicotinic acid and then people's problems start going away, especially skin stuff, as they take it longer. But sorry, just uh, wouldn't that create more retinoic acid, which then would go to the liver, which might overburden the liver if it's already overburdened? Is that a potential issue? That would be a step that, so we have to turn, generally retinoic acid is, is said in the research to be water soluble. So ah, retinoic okay. acid could potentially go out through the sweat. It could potentially go out through the kidneys. Um, and one of the big so things. So that's why that, the Scientology yeah. detox they would do hours of sweating with the niacin. Interesting. Yeah, so if you took, so if you did the flush niacin, the old, the old, and no, I have no association with Scientology. I, no, I'm no, kind I'm of sure. like with the Scientology <laughs> niacin detox. I'm kind of like even a broken clock is right twice a day. And if they were really interested in getting people off of alcohol and drugs and and that stuff for for their own purposes, and this worked. I'm not going to not use it because it was created by a guy who I wouldn't probably associate with ever. Sure. No, but yeah, I do it myself. I I will go and I'll do some cardio. I'll, I'll drink my niacin, my nicotinic acid in the parking lot of the gym. I'll go in, I'll do some cardio and then I'll go and I'll do some, uh, I'll sit in the steam room a bit to get the sweat really going. And then I'll go in the infrared sauna and, uh, I, I, I like it now just for anybody who's really toxic out there. If you jump right in with this at high doses of nicotinic acid and long times in the sauna, you're going to kick your own ass. Like it's, you have decades worth of toxicity in your liver and body fat. So if you dive in, it, it'll whip your ass. Like even, even in the science, even, there's a big Gulf war study on Gulf war vets who were poisoned, you know, overseas and they put them on, on a protocol like this. And after, I think it was eight or 12 weeks, they were doing a ton better. And I think they held the results. I think they checked it. They asked them again, like three months later, and they were still holding most of their results. So, but they were doing this. This was a big, they were doing low temperature sauna, but they were doing like two or three hours. So it wasn't as intense time. It was intense. I don't know. I couldn't have sat in there for two to three hours. That would just bore me to tears. But they had nothing else to do. These guys were probably on disability. They were probably like happy to have something to do, is my guess. Go listen to a podcast like this. What's that? <laughs> for, go listen to a podcast like this for a couple yeah, of hours. Yeah, right, way. right. Absolutely. <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, they, they say that one of the things that uh, one of the doctors who is a big advocate of this, uh, Dr. Root, I don't, I definitely don't agree with his dietary suggestions. But he was actually saying that there was, there, the research was that like in the infrared sauna, one of the things that really digs into is the, the fat related detox parts of sweat. So like your armpits and your groin is a different sweat than other parts. And he was saying that really pushes it out. Now, the funny thing he said about it was he's like, oh, this sauna will detox the fat soluble things out of your body and it will detox vitamin A and vitamin D and vitamin E out of your body. So wait, so this is where I go. You're saying it's a toxin. You're saying either the body knows what toxins are and you're calling those toxins or you're saying that the body is stupid and the body is dumping toxins through the sweat. I'm tending to believe that it's dumping toxins. But the body is also losing things like magnesium oh, for yeah. the sweat, right? Which, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, which are a well, nutrient. Oh, but wait, the more you sweat, the research has shown that the more you sweat, like you start regulating the amount of sodium you put in it. So your body will actually change the, the mineral composition of sweat over time as you sweat more. That's why like at the start of the summer, people are out in the heat and they get really, they get their butts kicked. But if they keep going out in the heat, their body starts adjusting their sweat. So they're not losing as much per hour or whatever you want to call it. So yeah, the body does adjust the, um, the, the minerals. And then this, this may be this, this fat soluble toxin coming out in the sweating and the heat may actually be why people who live in sunnier climates do better than people who live in, I mean, longevity has never been known to be cold, dreary clim climates. It's always associated yeah, with true. sunnier, warmer, you know, moderate temperature, sunnier places. I mean, people outside in the sun more, 
Well, the sun does oxidize toxins in your skin. So if we didn't eat too many of them and we were getting rid of them constantly, that makes sense. But now we have people like, well, let's say there's certain um, nose to tail paleo advocates out there and there's certain kings of liver eating who look red all the time. Well, what if they are so toxic? Well, here's what happens, what we see with people who do the vitamin A detox and they do the love your liver program and they do these things right. Over time, our people stop burning from the sun and they pretty much stop 95% of their tanning. So they stop, they don't tan anymore. They can go out in the sun all oh. day and they don't tan and they don't burn. Interesting. Doesn't make sense to anybody. And their, their eyes stop being so sensitive to the light. Whereas you look at all these other people out there, everybody's wearing sunglasses. Everybody's like, they can't, they can't look at this. I've, I had a guy who works on computers all day. He's like, my eyes don't hurt from the computer anymore. So we, we fix this light sensitivity, but these other guys who are constantly ingesting vitamin A are looking like they're constantly sunburned. Yes, they're tanned and they look red, constantly sunburned. And if anybody knows anything about liver health, and alcoholics, one of the first things you see in long-term alcoholics is their face turns bright red, right? They get the bulbous nose. Like it's, th that's in Chinese medicine, the liver is kind of showing in their face. The, the, the li liver heat is what they call it. So yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting to watch how this goes. And so you would say liver heat is really oxidized vitamin A. It's, it's, basically. An, it's an unhealthy liver is the biggest. Thing. <laughs> so I, I simplify these things to like people, people want to know mechanisms and they're like, what is doing this? And what is doing this? And I go, I don't know. I just fix it. I, the reason I've gotten so far, I believe in a lot of this is because I'm good at understanding how, how much we need to dig into something before it becomes a waste of time or mental masturbation. Like a lot of the mechanistic stuff, what I found about studies is when they look at cell studies, Cell studies are like one turnover of cells, right? Because they, they're not reproducing these cells. These cells are just, it, they're watching what the cell does. That's not a lifetime of toxicity. And that's also like, you know how I was saying, like parents will hand down toxicity to their kids. Well, if you never have another like round of cells come out of that one, you never get to see the effects of the toxicity that happen over time. And what I found is that a lot of the things that I see in cell studies are exactly the opposite of what I see in, in real people. So we, I, I've came up with this uh, concept called the duration paradox, which is where often things in cell studies look good and they're the exact opposite in real people. Or we look at short-term studies and they look good. Like think of how great if caffeine came out today, it would be touted as like the greatest thing in the world because nobody would know anything about it. And then if you look at a heavy caffeine users 10 years later, everybody knows how that goes. Like they can hardly get out of bed without drinking a pot of coffee. Like they're complete addicts. And so we, we see the duration paradox is like, they're like, oh, it's great for sports performance and energy and all this stuff. And then you start looking at the chronic use and it's completely the opposite. It makes you more tired. Because they're not valuing these studies for 20 years, which is usually what's required to see the full uh, impact. Yeah, I saw like a creatine study. Somebody was asking me about creatine the other day. And I said, I just, there's something about it long term that I'm absolutely not sure about for the kidneys, especially. So, and the, the longest study I found in my, in my search the other day, I think it was 21 months. I was like, okay, so <laughs> it, it, it's, that's long, but it's not 10 years long. Like that vitamin D study where 10 years later they saw lower bone density from vitamin D or the, or the study on low carb dieters where in men 10 years later, or was it 20 years later who identified as low carb dieters during that time, the low carb dieters 20 years later had the highest risk of diabetes. So it's like these things that we think are great short term, like does low carb lower your blood sugar short term and may it help you lose weight short term? Sure. Is it actually addressing the root cause of the problem, which may be that you're not processing or tolerating the carbs well because you have another problem somewhere else. And so if we fix that other problem somewhere else, then we have like what people get in my program where they tolerate carbs again. And they're like, oh, this is cool. I can eat carbs again and I don't gain weight and I feel good and I have energy and all this stuff. So we always have to look that that's another thing I do differently is I look long term. I, I only care about long term. If people are doing short term things for benefits, I consider it a band-aid or a crutch. Just to go back. Sorry, I realized I should have asked you this. 
why do you only like nicotinic acid and not niacinamide? Because I, I, my understanding was I thought nice, your body makes niacinamide out of nicotinic acid on its way to ultimately making NAD. So why, you, why do you only like nicotinic acid? Uh, nicotinic acid can go straight into what we call the priest handler pathway and just, just start making NAD. Like it, that's okay. It's been shown over and over that it is the it's even these fancy ones coming out like nicotinamide, riboside, and NMN and all that stuff. Nicotinic acid beats them in studies in terms of how much NAD comes out, and so it's cheaper, and it's been around a lot longer. And but niacinamide. Okay, so a lot of people will bring up the the new paper where they were saying like the more niacin people are taking in, the more risk of certain heart disease and all that stuff. Kelsey and I are going to do a video on this soon enough, but I showed it to her and she said, oh, this has got to be niacinamide. And so I went and I found the evidence in the paper and they, they, they keep trying to say niacin. So this is where they're starting to demonize. They, they can't get rid of flush niacin right away because flush niacin has even been sold as a pharmaceutical with, with a time release in it, right? They have to poison you somehow. They actually showed that the pharmaceutical with the time release in it caused a lot more pro caused problems. Whereas the, the crystalline powder nicotinic acid where people took it all at once didn't cause problems. So, and there's eight case studies of, of nicotinic acid, crystalline powder, supposedly causing problems since the 1950s. So in 74 years, there's supposedly eight case reports. And then when we start looking at the actual Kelsey delved into the case reports and all these guys are on multiple meds. And of course you're going to blame the, not a B vitamin. That's the other thing. Nicotinic acid is not a B vitamin. It is an amino acid. It is derived from tryptophan. It doesn't fit with the other B vitamins. The dosing of it is nothing like the other B vitamins. It's not a B vitamin. It's, it's, we consider it an amino acid. And, uh, and there is a very distinct deficiency syndrome of it called pellagra that looks a lot like vitamin A toxicity. And if you start to go, well, wait, this is where we get into the chicken or the egg. Was it a, a pellagra with, so the nicotinic acid or the NAD deficiency that caused people to get vitamin A toxic because you need, you need that to process aldehydes, right? Or was it the vitamin A toxicity that then caused the depletion of the NAD and then caused the pellagra symptoms? So anyway, it's, it's all very interesting. It all fits together very well. And then we have that, we have that whole like niacin flush, acute vitamin A toxicity, sunburn and all that pattern really quick. I mean, but the niacin flush is like an hour, maybe two. So it's a, like a super accelerated detox. So anyway, um, oh, the, the niacinamide study, the 4PY and the 2PY, they're saying these are metabolic byproducts that are damaging to the heart. And this is why niacin, too, too much niacin will cause problems. Nicotinic acid flush niacin doesn't turn into 4PY or 2PY. That's niacinamide. What do they put in supplements? Niacinamide. What do they put in fortified foods? Niacinamide. What do they put? It's, it's, it's a niacinamide excess problem. And then there's studies showing that excess niacin intake or the higher the niacin intake went, the more obesity they see. Well, they're fortifying our food. It's niacin, niacinamide. That's what they're fortifying our foods with. So niacinamide is what Kelsey refers to, uh, and I'm sure, I think she got this from other papers, but it's called the salvage pathway. And so it's like, it's not the best pathway to go from. It's the salvage pathway. It's like rescuing it to make more NAD. Mm. We, if I we can see. just put it in and bypass that whole salvage pathway, it's kind of like, keto, yeah. So if we can bypass the salvage pathway, pathway, then we can do much better and not have all the waste products. Like the 4PY and the 2PY that they're saying are bad. It's kind of like I tell people about ketosis. I say, if you run out of ketones in your blood, what happens to you? People usually don't have an answer. And I say, nothing happens to you if you run out of ketones. There's, there's no such thing as a ketone deficiency. What happens if you run out of blood glucose? You're dead. So which one is critical for your function and your living and which one is like a survival state mode? Hopefully it's obvious. Ketones are a survival state thing. So if people want to switch, they're like, oh, but I think so much better when I'm in a survival state of mind. Like when I've got this flowing, I'm like, okay, 
That's cool. That's not going to last. That's a stress state. That's a survival state. Um, and so when we start thinking of these, I, I just, I don't know how I get these perspectives on things. I wish more people did it. Um, Kelsey's actually Kel Kelsey who brought the, the nicotinic acid to my attention. She's actually very much into these same kind of thinking patterns and mindsets as I am. And that's why we click so well. And that's why I, I understood her so quickly on the nicotinic acid. So, but that's, yeah, it's nicotinic acid or nothing flush niacin. We don't chase the flush. We don't avoid the flush. We don't chase the flush. So you're not trying to make it happen, but you're also not like scared of it happening. And I, I regularly do. I don't know if you've seen my live streams, but I'll regularly drink my ni my nicotinic acid on the stream to show people I'll kind of get pink and I'll get a little itchy. And I'm like, see, it's nothing to be scared of. Um, and as you do it longer, it gets less and you get more used to it. And the funny thing is the very weird thing is, is you start to kind of, it's like your body learns that it's good for it and you kind of start to like it. Yeah. I found it addictive. One question I had, I, I would always feel cold after I had it. Do you have any explanation as to why that would be the case? So this is, I've had some people say, oh, well, some people are saying they're more tired with it. Or some people are saying they're you know, like a little cold with it. Well, I try to help them remember that like getting we're, 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 it's an accelerated detox, right? So if all of a sudden you start dumping more stuff out of your liver and nicotinic acid has been shown to increase bile production. So if all of a sudden, let's say you're dumping more bile and that bile still does have toxic stuff in it because your liver is not empty yet, then you may have more of this stuff floating around your system for a while and you may get some of the symptoms of this toxicity, but then that fades, right? Because you clear yeah, it out. Yeah, and I just, as you say, if you do sauna along with it, just, you know, yeah. just do the sauna so that you don't feel cold. It's pretty simple. Just curious. <laughs> no, that, that's, that's my theory on it. It's, it's, uh, I, I remember when I first started doing it, I, uh, I would go and I would work out after it because I was trying to do the kind of like cardio thing or whatever. So I'd go and I'd lift weights. And I was like, man, I don't feel quite as strong when I do this. And I just kind of went, okay. So I, I know I'm still, I've still got, plenty of toxicity in my liver. I've just gotten, I've gotten it down to the point where I've gotten rid of my health issues. So that's the thing that people need to understand is like, you can get better. Some people on Twitter are like saying this is like a two year, three year, five year process to really get better. Well, I tell them that's true, but you can get rid of certain symptoms at any point along the way. Like it, it's, it's, it's like checking off boxes before. If you want to say it's five years until everything's gone. Okay but you can see things go away. Some people have things go away in a month, two months, three months, and then they're gone. And then, then they get into deeper things as they go longer. So it's, um, it is a process, but the, the detox stuff with the nicotinic acid, I'm, I was just okay with it. And now I don't really notice myself getting tired from it, but I've also adjusted it. I'd be like, well, okay. So if I was going to go do some sort of competition, which working out in the gym, should not really be a competition. It's just like it's trudging along and moving forward over time. But like if I was going to a competition where I wanted to have my best energy, I don't take my flush before I do it. It's as simple as that. I could take it later in the day. It's not that hard to work around. <laughs> you know, if you were going to go out in the cold, you might be like, well, if I can't do the sauna, maybe I shouldn't do my niacin flush before I go out in the cold because it makes me cold. Okay. So you just adjust around it like that. It's not a huge thing, but I do think it's a big detox. And I do think as you get quote unquote cleaner, it doesn't, those symptoms don't happen as much. So are you a fan of red light therapy, by the way? Cause you're obviously a fan of infrared cause that's heat, uh, along with doing the niacin. The first practice I worked in, in Tucson was a low intensity laser practice where we used red light and infrared light. So now like everybody's getting into red light and I'm like, I was doing that in 2006. I'm, I'm very much an early adopter. Like I've been through all this stuff. So are you still a fan? That's the question. I'm still a fan of it. It does actually speed up ALDH. I showed there, there's a study on formaldehyde dehydrogenase where red light stimulated formaldehyde dehydrogenase to go faster. And then, so, so I'm just saying, oh wait, this is just saying what we're doing is right. is speeding up aldehyde dehydrogenase and people are feeling better. Like, but also Maybe you've known people where if they do too much red light in a session, they don't feel good. That's a dump. That's like they're bile dumping. They just triggered. So we just said it sped up ALDH. Well, if you speed up, if, if slowing down ALDH slows down bile production, speeding up ALDH should speed up bile production. 
And so that's where with some people, if they overdo the sun, that can cause bile dumping. If they overdo red light, that can cause bile dumping. So we just, that's another thing we, we allow people to customize to themselves is like, if you know, there's a certain amount of time under the red light that makes you feel bad. And there's a lower time than that, that you feel fine with, then do the fine time. You're not trying to punish yourself. Like you're still detoxing at nine minutes. If 10 minutes is the one that makes you feel bad. Like the nine minutes was the lion's share of it. The 10 minutes was just over the cliff. So we, we just, we give people, we treat people like adults. Like they can watch these things and then say, this felt good. This didn't. We don't necessarily pursue things that, that uh, let's, let me put it that, let me change that. This felt fine. And this didn't versus because I, I say that because people will say, well, if this feels good to me, doesn't that mean I should do it? And I go, I have a little saying for that. It's crackheads love crack. That doesn't mean it's good for them. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, druggies <laughs> love drugs, you know, alcoholics love alcohol. That, that doesn't mean anything is good for them. They'll, they'll say they feel better on it because they're an addict. That doesn't mean it's good for them. Right. So, um, like when you say you felt kind of addicted to the nicotinic acid, I, I would, I would correct that to, it's like you, I would correct that to like, you enjoy it. If you didn't do it for a couple of days, you might, it's like, it's like I say about meat, like I'm not addicted to meat. If I didn't have it for a week, I'd be kind of like, man, I want some meat. This sucks. But I'm not like going through withdrawals and like, oh my God, what did I can't, I can't go on without meat. Like it's, I'm not begging, <laughs> standing on the street corner, offering to do strange things to get some meat. Um, you know, it's, it's just, I, I, I like to say there's a difference between enjoying something and knowing it's good for you versus something that people are addicted to and where they get actually like withdrawal symptoms if they don't have it. So that's, I just like to make that clear. Yeah. It's an important distinction. Absolutely. Um, I'm aware of your time. I really appreciate you've been so generous with it. Um, I would just love to, uh, make reiterate again, uh, tell people how they can find you, what the best next step is. Uh, if they, if, if like me, they've resonated with a lot of what you said, what's the next thing that they should do? Well, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of things there's, um, so my main website is nutritiondetective.com. That's where you can find, I do make a couple of supplements that all, all like additive free, preservative free, filler free, all that stuff. So very few companies do that. I, I make that a, the highest priority in everything we do. Um, my Twitter handle is nutri detect N U T R I D E T E C T. I very regularly post there. Um, and if you want to get started on reading more of my stuff on Twitter, go to my pinned thread because that that's like a thread of threads and you can, you can get all the background on all that stuff. I do my live stream. Uh, if you just look on nutrition detective on YouTube, you'll find me there. Um, I've been doing on YouTube, a live stream every week for the last, I think we're doing show 138 in a row this, this week. So apparently I'm healthy enough to do a live stream every, every, and I didn't, and it's two and a half to three hours sometimes. So yeah, it's, it's going well. Um, so then where else am I? I mean, I'm on Facebook. If you look on Facebook, nutrition detective, uh, Instagram, nutrition detective worldwide, but the, the meat of my stuff is going to be the live streams on YouTube and the, um, and, and Twitter if you wanted to work with me or Nathan and we're working on, I'm training some new practitioners to do the hair and blood analysis with clients. Um, you can find that on the main website, nutritiondetective.com. And yeah, so we give one of the things we do different with our testing and consultation packages is we include, if you buy a package to work with one of us, you get six months of support with that. So, I consider it like I consider that actually the biggest difference. I mean, other than the fact that I do everything different than everybody else, um, I consider that the biggest difference in what we do where one of the things I didn't like as a doctor, as an ethical and moral person would be like, let's say, let's say you came in to see me and I said, okay, I want you to go and do this and take this and we'll do this therapy and whatever. Okay. So you go and you do those things and let's say in a week or two, you're doing it and you're like, I feel worse. This happens. This is regularly happening. 
to, it can happen to my people. It can happen to anybody else's people. If you take something that doesn't agree with you, you don't feel good. And I, I, I'm not going to say I have a crystal ball and I can read what every person needs exactly down to the milligram and all that stuff. So what we do is the troubleshooting that people need. So instead of like a normal doctor or another practitioner where then they gave you something that made you feel bad or that didn't work. Now you have to pay them more money to yeah. fix the problem <laughs> that they just caused, right? That doesn't make any sense. So what I decided to do was different. I decided to include the support because this is, especially when I'm talking about people taking responsibility for their own health. If, if you want to do this work, like I do not have a magic pill. I have diligent, consistent, hard work to truly fix the deeper problems that are why you're sick so that these things can stay away. And you will then know what your body agrees with. You will know what your body doesn't agree with. You will know the patterns of bile dumping when it happens. And maybe you don't feel good when that happens. You will know the signs of when you're doing things that aren't good for you. Like you will start, people learn more about their bodies through all of this because not only do we give them the guidance during each six month segment, but we let them, we give them the okay that if, if something doesn't feel, if something feels better, sure, try a little bit more of it. If something feels worse, don't keep taking it because I said so. Like you have the okay to stop it and then come to office hours and tell me about it. And then we can start tweaking and figuring it out. Like this lady who couldn't eat red meat or dark meat chicken or chicken. Like that was weeks of figuring that out. And then now she's coming back out of it because she listened to her body and she gave us the feedback and it was all included. She didn't get nickel and dimed for every little visit. So that's, that's a big thing that I consider we do very differently. And I take, I take a lot of pride in that. So, so office hours means not just email support. They can actually come on to calls yeah, and, and it uh, is a, it is a small group zoom meeting. Um, yeah. Cause I couldn't do individual. I mean, I regularly have like 16 in a, in a two and a half hour session, I'll have 16 questions. And so to get through that, it's, it, we're, we're rocking and rolling, but we're giving each person at least 10 minutes and, uh, and then they get to hear the answers from other people. So if people, if people want distinct privacy, I don't have, I've got too many people to work with to give everybody a half hour session. And, uh, a lot of the questions are answered in there, but yeah, so it's a small group session. I do one a week. My, my other practitioner, Nathan does one of those a week. And then, like I said, we're working on more practitioners. So there'll be more in a week. And so, and then we have, so where can people get answers? Well, they could go to the office hours if they're a client. Yeah. Email support. I didn't like email support. It took me tons of time. And then people, well, I'm just going to be honest. People don't have great reading comprehension these days and they just don't read everything you send them. And then if they miss things that are important, then they mess things up. So I just found that relying on people to read emails and me taking the time to type it out so that they interpret it correctly was just way too much. So I just went to this format and it's, it seems to work really well. People really love it. We actually, we have a lot of, we usually have about twice as many people as questions come to listen because people like hearing the troubleshooting and they'll get answers for questions they didn't even know they had until I answered it. And then they go, Oh, I've been having that. Oh, let me fix it. And then they fix it and they come and they tell me and they said, I didn't even ask a question and, I, and you fixed something. So it's, it's pretty cool, but only people who are clients get to go to those. So then other places people can get answered questions answered. There is the, the live stream. There's, we do super chats on there. If you have a really important question you want answered, you can do a little donation. You can hop to the top of the line. And then there's also the inner circle, which is inside the love your liver network or the, the nutrition detective network, the love your liver program. That's my network at members.nutritiondetective.com. And that is I, right after my YouTube live stream. If you can imagine after a two and a half to three hour live stream, I then go into the inner circle and I will answer questions from the members of the inner circle for another hour and a half to two hours. So I'm answering questions live for like five hours straight some days. So apparently my brain is working okay without vitamin A and all these things. <laughs> Also shows you love what you do, which is awesome. I do. 
I just want to say I'm a member of the Love, Love Your Liver program. I think I have been for a year. Uh, I thought it was fantastic. I've been through it, I think, probably three times. I have found it very valuable, and I think it's worth going through more than once. Um, so that's my highest kind of recommendation, really, for that. Thank you so much for being here. We've literally only got to probably less than half of my questions. So maybe if you're open to doing a part two at some point, we haven't even talked about copper, let alone, you know, so many other things. But maybe if you're open to doing a part two at some point, that'd be fantastic. But okay, fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time and for your, uh, your wisdom. And thank you so much, yeah, as I said, from a personal level of helping me to answer some questions about what was going on with me that literally no one else had the answer to. Um, and for not just, you know, answering what's wrong, which is nice, but actually giving some solutions that work. That's, that's all I want to do is I just, I just want stuff that works, not that doesn't hide it, but is actually addressing. I, I just, the last thing I'll say is I took, we, we took an oath of naturopathic medicine, like for the naturopathic medical principles. And one of them was treat the cause. That's supposed to be what doctors are trying to do. Pharmaceuticals don't treat a cause. Herbs don't treat a cause. Sticking acupuncture needles in people doesn't treat a cause. Like I will call BS on everybody. Most medicine is band-aids. And so the two pieces of the naturopathic principles that I took the most to heart, one was first do no harm. Well, that's pretty damn important. And the second one was treat the cause. And so if we are working with essential minerals and foods and an amino acid and these other things, and they are in theory, these should be the things that are the least likely to cause harm to people, right? Because we're actually testing them to see if they're deficient. And if they're deficient, then we are trying to correct the deficiency. We're trying to correct toxicities that we see people improve with. And then I, oh, the other one is doctor as teacher. I'm trying to teach people to, to, to teach a man how to fish, right? That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to teach you how to watch your health, how to know what to do for your health, and how to watch your health so that then you can then take that later. I'm trying to make people so they don't need me anymore. There's plenty of sick people out there for me to have a living. <laughs> There's no shortage of sick people. But if, but if I can have people learn it and then they don't need me and then they can help their kids and they can help their friends and they can help their parents, then you know I'm making the world a better place rather than just saying, I have all the information, I'll give it to you in little teeny bits as you need it and then you always need me. That's not, that's not what I'm trying to do. I think you gave all the information in your program. And so, as you said, the one-on-ones are really not for any secret information. They're just people who need guidance and support with specific situations, right? Yes. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me. It was great to be here. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed that, I recommend watching our latest episode, which you can do by clicking above. And make sure to subscribe, like the video, comment, and share with anyone who you think might appreciate it. Thank you.